Well, good afternoon, everyone. I think we're all pretty much arranged, so why don't we go ahead and get our final panel for the day going. First, I'd like to one last time thank our distinguished panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules to take part in this important discussion, as well as the members of SGIL and Stanford <coughs> Law for putting together this event and arranging this beautiful venue for all of us. So thank you, guys. Um, our final panel today is a nice, straightforward, and uncontroversial topic. Uh, the promise and pitfalls of multilateral cooperation for cybersecurity. So I'm sure we're going to wrap up early. Um, we won't be able to do justice, of course, to all of this in just the next 80 or so minutes, but hopefully we can make some headway in discussing a few timely topics to see where, as we've been discussing, the elusive consensus might lie. After the panelists' opening remarks, we will be, uh, begin by addressing just a couple of questions I'm going to throw out there to give you guys a heads up on what those are. First, can multilateral treaties prove useful in securing cyberspace? If so, what might an ideal cybersecurity treaty look like? Even if, even if such treaties are feasible, are they also desirable? Second, if a treaty isn't possible or desirable, what other alternatives exist? And we've hit it on some of those already in terms of norms. Third, what is the best we can hope for in terms of peace on the internet? Is cyber peace possible? What might it look like before we throw it open to a much broader and I'm sure richer discussion after that? Before we get there though, let me just introduce our uh, distinguished speakers here in turn. I think you know me too well already. Um, next to me, I'm honored to have Dr. Hamadoun Touré, who's of course the Secretary General of the ITU, which as a reminder is a specialized UN agency tasked with regulating information, telecommunications, uh, and technologies. He's done a lot of incredible things for our purposes on the cybersecurity side in particular. He's been vocal on issues such as banning cyber weapons and the fact that the ITU could help broker such a cyber disarmament accord. Uh, this afternoon, Dr. Torrey's presentation is going to be entitled Building Global Cyber Resilience Through Improved Cooperation. In particular, he'll be discussing multi-stakeholder governance and how we can leverage industry, civil society, and governments to work together to hopefully more <laughs> adequately address our common cybersecurity challenges. Uh, next to Dr. Torrey, of course, we have Howard Schmidt, who we already heard a great deal about today. But just to remind us, he's the former cybersecurity coordinator for the Obama administration, currently a partner with Tom Ridge and Ridge Schmidt. Uh, cybersecurity consulting. He has more than 40 years' experience in defense, law enforcement, and corporate security. Uh, Mr. Schmidt was formerly president of Information Security Forum, a former VP at eBay, and former chief security officer at Microsoft, as well as being, of course, a Harley Davidson aficionado. Um, during his time at the White House, Mr. Schmidt did a number of important things. He's already mentioned the national strategy for trusted identities in cyberspace that envisions the idea of an identity ecosystem. Also, he helped pioneer the international strategy for cyberspace, which I believe will be one of his topics for today, which sets forth comprehensive vision for cyberspace, including goals for defense, diplomacy, and development. And finally, we have Professor Cheng after that, uh, certainly not least, but last in order here, who's joining us from Berkeley, the School of Information, where he is on the faculty as well as being editor-in-chief of the China Digital Times, which he founded in 2003. Um, professor is actually a theoretical physicist by training, as if cybersecurity wasn't hard enough. He was doing his PhD in astrophysics at Notre Dame up until, I believe, the Tiananmen Square Massacre, at which point he became a full-time human rights activist. He worked for a long time in New York with several NGOs. Since 2003, he's been on Berkeley's faculty where he's researching state censorship. He teaches courses in digital activism and is running the Counter Power Lab, which is an interdisciplinary faculty student group researching innovative technologies to expand the free flow of information. And um, today the professor will be discussing the evolving private sector experience in China as it relates to cybersecurity using Yahoo, Google, and Apple as case studies. So that's a quick rundown there. So we're kind of going from the international to the national to more of the private sector comparative perspective as we go down the list here. Because I want to make sure we have ample time for all of our distinguished panelists and most importantly questions from all of you, I'm going to limit my remaining remarks to just a couple things. First, to build off our discussion of the changing conceptions of sovereignty as we talk about cybersecurity, and second, the applicability of international law a little bit in some of the camps we've been talking about, because again, lawyers love to categorize things, so I'll try to do that just briefly too. As we mentioned in our first panel, cyber threats are global threats, right? We talked about the interconnection of cyberspace already and that nations have to work together to foster what the ITU, among other institutions, has called a global culture of cybersecurity. But even though criminals and non-state groups are, of course, cooperating across borders, many nations aren't on the same page in terms of enhancing cybersecurity. In lots of cases, we're not even reading from the same book. 
China and Russia are pursuing a much more heavy-handed example, for example, in looking at critical national infrastructure uh, than we are here in the U.S., where we worry more about, I would argue, innovation, civil liberties, other issues like that. And of course, the nomenclature we use between countries varies too. A lot of countries prefer information security, bringing in the idea of content more than our term cybersecurity that we prefer here in the States. Uh, and of course, questions of censorship and internet governments come into play, which our panelists are very well positioned to help answer. Indeed, the role of national governments in cybersecurity and internet governance is, according to Dr. Craig Rattray, who's now at Delta Risk, the major issue of the next decade. Uh, and how we resolve this issue has important implications for the private and public sectors alike. As Professor Jack Goldsmith, who's now at Harvard, has said, the internet will look the way powerful states want it to look. And as the network center of gravity, if there is such a thing, moves more toward Asia, that begins to take on even a greater meaning. For example, by 2017, if current trends continue, the dominant language on the internet will be Mandarin. What effect is that going to have? Um, there seems to be a growing debate, as we've alluded to, between, and this is a gross oversimplification, so you'll have to excuse me, the idea of internet sovereignty. So that could be thought of as a state-centric view of cybersecurity and internet governance. And internet freedom, the notion that we should have a single global networked commons, in the words of former Secretary of State Clinton, a view propounded by the US government, though of course there's plenty of ways we don't always live up to that ideal ourselves. Uh, there's many kind of shades of gray between that, but it helps illustrate some of the reasons that finding this consensus at the multilateral level has been so difficult. Even close allies, such as our NATO allies, don't collaborate oftentimes as much as we might think in cybersecurity. There's a lot going on between the five eyes, for example, US, UK, Australia, Canada, New Zealand. Not so with other NATO nations, but of course, maybe as part of the international strategy, we're going to start to see a broadening out in that regard, since of course no nation is an island in cyberspace. But what international law applies? We've already hit on this very ably, I think, but I thought I would just categorize a few of the ideas out there that I was at least able to come up with in a th throughout the book and throughout all the experts I was speaking with. Uh, first, as has been said, I think we're doing pretty well with the cyber war component. There's a law of armed conflict out there, and I think we're applying it, and it's crystallizing in a nice way. The, the problem, of course, is that that's great, but we're not experiencing cyber war, right? So what do we do about the other 99%? How do we define a law of cyber peace, in other words? And that's where the action is, and that's where I think a lot of academic work and a lot of work on the private sector side needs to happen as well. A second camp pretty much says this is a new domain, so we need a new treaty to manage it. So a treaty for cyberspace and the guidance of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea or the Outer Space Treaty, right? Uh, Rex Hughes, who used to be at Chatham House, has an article out about this. And it's an attractive idea. The UN, of course, has been involved in different types of negotiations for cybersecurity since the late 90s. Until 2009, the U.S. wasn't all that enthusiastic about this kind of notion. We've seen a little more of a push in that direction with the international strategy, among other documents. Um, but still, evidence of the contrary, we're seeing the use of cyber weapons. I think Stuxnet also kind of go against that trend to an extent. Um, and you have to keep in mind certain quotes, for example, from Harvard professor Joseph Nye, who said that large-scale formal treaties regulating cyberspace seem unlikely for the foreseeable future. We might agree with that. We might disagree with that. But I just thought I would throw it out there for discussion. Uh, two other final camps here. A third camp pretty much says international law is not going to save us. That's the idea of Stuart Baker, of course, among others. Pretty straightforward there. Fourth, perhaps surprisingly, are commentators, um, yeah, among them Richard Clark, who say that, yes, international law has a role to play, uh, but we have to focus particularly on states and states securing their own borders and, and their own networks and helping one another to deal with these common challenges. Those are some of the camps. I think that Dr. Torrey in particular is well positioned to discuss recent developments at the UN and maybe how we can bridge some of those divides by bringing in this idea of multi-stakeholder governance, which he and, of course, um, Howard have, are both very well engaged with at the international and national level as well. Um, so with that, I thought I would hand things over to, uh, to Dr. Tory at this point, we'll, who will be discussing this notion of multi-stakeholder governance, how we can make it work, and uh, how, how it's going to help us hopefully get a better handle on some of these challenges going forward. So please, Dr. Thank you, Scott, and uh, good, good afternoon to you all. It's good to be back again. Uh, the issue, the, first of all, let me talk about the extent of the problem. We all talk about the number of uh, botnets, number of uh, cyber attacks, numbers of uh, billions of dollars that are diverted every year. Uh, in fact, nobody can put a real figure on those numbers, as somebody said this afternoon. Uh, for the simple reason that banks don't tell, never tell you how much money has been stolen. 
and banks and insurance companies are the most difficult ones in, in that sense because, of course, it's not in their interest to say these kind of things, and therefore the information is really not available. And uh, as the, uh, the lady from uh, New York Times said this morning, uh, I mean, everyone has been attacked, and or you have two groups, or those who have been attacked and those who are not saying it, or they don't know they've been attacked. In fact, they know they have been attacked, but they will not simply say it. It's a global phenomenon. We are dealing with uh, an issue where, the, I mean, you have the crime side and the government uh, state-sponsored attacks as well, mm -hmm. but the fact is that we are dealing with, with a phenomenon where the criminal is no, no, is not necessarily on the crime scene, first. Second, the criminal can act in many countries at the same time, many places at the same time, without having been in any of them. And the laws that I apply in his country may not apply in where the crimes are being made. So that makes it a very complex issue. And therefore, there is, that's where there's a need of uh, involvement at the international level to say have some framework now the uh, nobody discussion the multi stakeholder model of uh, of the internet and uh, the best way is to make sure that governments do take into account the views of private sector and civil society when dealing when discussing these issues in fact I was probably one of the first to talk about the concept of cyber peace, a cyber peace treaty. I said it in Davos in 2007 in a very provo provocative manner because I knew it's difficult to broker a treaty. People are very reluctant to go into a treaty simply because when they sign a treaty, they have to respect some parts of that treaty and they will be accountable for it. And therefore, people don't want to do it, and especially if they know that there may be cases where they may have to counterattack. Now, the other aspect of the problem is the fact that a single individual may clone a whole country. I mean, if I wanna address an attack to the US, it's easy for me if, if, if I can put some Chinese scripts in that program, I mean, of course, will be easily said that it was coming from China and uh, or from Russia. If I put some Russian scripts in there, as we have seen in the cases of uh, of Estonia in 2007, 2007 or 2009, the Estonia case uh, had so many Russian scripts. You would wonder if. Uh, Russians, if uh, Russians will deliberately leave Russian scripts when they are initiating an attack, would a, a burglar leave his ID, ID card in the room before leaving? Mm -hmm. That's something that's questionable. And, and therefore, what I can, what I want to say here that there is danger is that a, an individual can clone a whole country initiate an attack and the, the wrong country will be counterattacked. So there are, you have those things. We, uh, so when I was talking about uh, the concept of cyber peace, by the way, I never use cyber war. What, I, what, I'm, try, what I'm meaning by cyber peace is a completely new type of uh, concept. It's a peace before war. And that's, that's the, 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 what I wanted to do here. A peace before war, what, that's what, what it makes it very special. And a kind of treaty that will be not brokered only by governments. It will be a huge round table with over 193 member states, but also private sector, civil society. And my question at the time, I was saying, are government prepared for that to be sitting on equal footing with private sector and civil society. Were that mental preparedness there? And the answer was no, it was not there. But I, I had to be provocative because we have to deal with the issue. It's a phenomenon that's coming, it's growing, and we need to talk about it. Um, that's why 
I, I, and I use it in the framework of the global cybersecurity agenda that I created in 2007 after my election as Secretary General uh, in response to the uh, action line that was given to ITU by the World Summit on Information Society, the WSIS, that took place in Tunis in 2005. Among the 11 action lines, the action line C2, which was on infrastructure, and C5 on creating a, an environment for cyber security, for confidence and security in the cyberspace. Actually, the thing was very specific, and somebody used that word today, confidence and security in the cyberspace. That means that we really wanted to do this before there is a war, and that's really the important part of it. But of course, we've seen the ideological differences among countries in that. There is huge uh, difference. I would see something worse than the Cold War, starting when we are debating this. In fact, when I created the Global Cybersecurity Agenda and asked for a report to be prepared to look at to the environment, it was chaired by George Scholberg from Sweden, who was from Norway, sorry, who was member of the Council of Europe when it was done in 2002-2003 for the, the Budapest Convention. And I asked him to look at all of the existing frameworks, the, the, the seoul Melbourne Agreement, the London Accord, all of those to be looked at so that we, we don't have to reinvent the wheel or duplicate, and, but take the essence of the good things that are in each of those to put it on the table. And that's what we did in that report. And it came out with uh, some very uh, strong recommendations in five different areas. One, creating the legal and regulatory framework. Two, putting the technical uh, uh, and procedural framework in place. That's the easiest one because technic technology is ready for it. In fact, it's a legal and, regu and, and, and regulatory uh, legal uh, and regulatory framework that is the most difficult part. Three, put the organizational structures in place in every country and then in uh, and worldwide for capacity building. That's important. When people are trained on this, they can prevent many of those. And last but not least, an international framework of cooperation that will help ease the tensions as we're talking. Having seen in those meeting rooms the fights, the ideological fights among the member states, because you're talking about issues that will be content related, therefore privacy and freedom of speech issues are um, very sensitive in those. I, I could see the wide differences among countries, cultural differences, religious differences. I finally, I said to myself at one point in time, I need to find a common denominator for that people can walk as, as they talk. Also, why are we gonna spend endless time in those meeting rooms while criminals are working against our countries, against our children, against our companies? What do we do? So that's why how we came up with the Child Online Protection Initiative, COP. That was a common denominator, children. We said to ourselves, children, that's, that's a low hanging fruit where we can all work together. If we find a good framework to combat crime against children, which is the same everywhere. Child pornography is a crime everywhere, but pornography is not necessarily a crime if it's an adult. Depending on your religious or other type of beliefs, it may or may not be a crime in different countries. Therefore, we needed to find that common denominator, children. And guess what? If you are able to find a good framework to protect children, the same framework can work for anything else. That's how we started this thing. Not being naive in thinking that there will be, a, everybody will come jump and, and, and sign a, a global treaty. It's a very difficult issue. But I believe that it's an important matter that we need to all uh, look at. And this is how we came with also the concept at one point in time. I was brainstorming with some heads of states, and the Prime Minister of Tunisia is the one who came up with me on this thing. He said, Hamadun, you will not have a consensus on a global treaty. Why don't you go for what a common code of conduct, three Cs? And since the action line on cybersecurity was actual line CC5, we came up with five Cs actually at that time, common code of conduct against cybercrime. So the five C's for, three, for, for, for C5 
was kind of uh, were playing with the, the words better. Uh, the idea came from that prime minister, mm -hmm. and I, I found it very, very attractive. And I started brainstorming with member states. And I know the UN system. Anything that comes from the Secretary General is dead. I would not dare to make a proposal in the system. <laughs> it's, it's clear. I know that. I know the rules of the game. What I do is to discuss the issues that I believe in with member states individually, and I will find one that will pick it up and make it his own and bring it over on the table. And then I'll say, are you sure? And he will, he will continue to defend the issue. That's how I was approaching it. Unfortunately, when I, was, I started debating this, some countries took it and took it straight to the Security Council with the Common Code of Conduct, and it was dead there because of the ideological position that those countries had in the, in, in, to start with. And therefore, the idea of a Common Code of Conduct did not fly. But I still believe that there is still room for a cyber peace agreement. I believe that uh, we should uh, agree on some common principles mm -hmm. that are embedded, in, in fact, in some of the uh, existing treaties like the Budapest Convention. As I said, the Budapest Convention is a very good one. It, of course, it dates back 2003. It says the benefit of uh, being the first global, t the first, uh, it was a regional treaty, meant to be regional for Europe only. Mm -hmm. That's why some of, the some of the articles in it, from the Article 36, down to that are dealing with actual, actually with uh, some procedural matters such as the ratification procedure are more Eurocentric. You can, if you clean it up, you can really have a, a very good framework and add some others. So therefore, I believe that there is a basis for things that we can work on. But uh, of course, it is also a very sensitive issue. I will stop here. Thank you so much, Dr. Torrey. And there's a lot there we might want to pick up on later, depending on how the discussion goes as well, like the idea of the common code of conduct, the idea of the like-minded nations that was present in the last panel. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to maybe bring it a little more toward the U.S. perspective and broaden it out by inviting uh, Mr. Schmidt to offer some, uh, talk, uh, some talking points on the international strategy and some related subjects, I believe, as well. Thanks, Scott. And uh, I'd like to, to thank my friend, too, for his leadership in this area. I remember uh, back when you started the Global Cybersecurity Agenda and asked me to participate, which I was very proud to do. People say, well, why would you do that? Now, I mean, it's, uh, and, and the bottom line is the concept of cyber peace. I don't know anybody that should not be behind that. Uh, the idea of, of preserving what the internet has given to us and why we should be doing everything we can to pre preserve that, so so I thank you for that that bringing that forward. So a few things, and I'll talk a little bit about the international strategy. But uh, the former panel and, and some things that John had mentioned uh, in, in the panel, I think I'd like to to hit on those because they hit to the core of what this panel is about. Mm -hmm. uh, first thing, which I, I find really interesting, is when we start looking at the government's role in cyberspace and how we look at sort of the internationalization of this. Uh, one of the things I find it's, it's really interesting, and the comment was made earlier about the internet culture, I think Norbert, you brought that up. Mm -hmm. We do have an internet culture, um, and we've had it for a long time. Matter of fact, in the early days, we used to be called netizens because we were netizens, uh, network citizens is basically what it was all about. And to this day, uh, we've been able to do a lot of things without the government doing it. And that's one of the things that I think many of us have been concerned about is what is government's role in this, particularly from the international perspective. Uh, Sopa Pipa, I know, uh, uh, I don't know if Paul's still here, but he, oh, there he is. Brought, yeah, brought up about <laughs> Sopa Pipa. Uh, Anish Chopra, the, the former CTO of the White House and of the US government and myself, we actually did a White House blog saying our recommendation to the president, if Congress passes this, is to veto it. Uh, and that was not only in part because of our experiences, but seeing what was taking place in, in the world of saying how fundamentally flawed this is. You undermine security in order to protect another thing. So, so there's some things that I think are really important that have been brought up that we really need to uh, consider when we look at the international piece. A couple other things before I get into the treaty and, and sort of the international uh, strategy is the terms that we've he I've heard people use, including, uh, once again, I hate to quit picking on Paul because I'm not, because I have tremendous respect for him, but a couple times used the term uh, the domain, which I hear is used all the time. 
that cyberspace is a new domain of warfare. Uh, and, and, and I still struggle with that because the whole concept of cyber war is fundamentally flawed onto its own thing. There's, there's some really well-defined uh, legal provisions about what a war is and there's, you know, in the United States, you know, congressional investment, everything else. But we use these terms so loosely and particularly with the international uh, agreement piece of it, words really, really matter. So the, the whole concept of uh, using cyber war and global, a global commons is the other one that somehow the networks that we own and operate, businesses, individuals, governments, uh, a academia, to somehow think this forms a global commons just because we can all access it lo globally is, is again a, a fundamental uh, flaw that I think we wind up using all the time. And, and the next thing I want to touch on, and particularly when the use of military, and I want to use two quick things. Some of you probably in this room remember something that was a really dark day in the history of U.S. Uh, uh, activists, and that was the uh, massacre at Kent State. Back in the 60s, if you're not familiar with it, a lot of protesting going on at campuses around the country. Uh, what was thought to be a valid response was taking the National Guard and having them respond, which ultimately resulted in a shooting in which some students were killed. Uh, since that, and unfortunately because of that, the use of military not only is prohibited within the United States on civilian populations, but basically has been a basic tenant that we look at. Let's switch over to cyberspace for a minute, and let's look at some activists that we see on a day-to-day -day basis, whether we agree with why they're doing it, what they're doing. The bottom line is, I'm not sure that I think the world, let alone many of us, would say, okay, so we have a group of hacktivists in four different countries and we decide to use the military, whatever military, against them because they're, they're protesting something. And we see that, and I know a lot of your work goes into what the government's role, particularly the military role. So that's something I think we really need to think about when we start looking at what is the way forward, how do we develop those norms. The second point I want to uh, point on and the, the intellectual property lawyers in there, help me trademark this or whatever. <laughs> so I have, uh, have way too much time on my hands, some people uh, claim, that I sit on planes and read The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Some people may consider it boring, but I find it particularly interesting when you look back to the history and see how it applies in cyberspace. And there was one passage in there that I read one time about use of fire in a military context. And I found it fascinating, and I spent the rest of the six-hour flight thinking about it. So my own, obviously I can't attribute it to a, to, to a uh, renowned person as him, but my own Howardism on this is, so it's okay to use fire in war if some conditions exist. One, the wind's not blowing back at you. <laughs> mm -hmm. The second thing, if it indeed is blowing back at you, that you have nothing that is flammable. And the third thing, if you have something that's flammable, it's of no consequence to you. And the context in cyberspace, when we start looking at the work that, that many of us care about, is the use of cyber weapons. Mm -hmm. If indeed there's a conflict and a reason to use it, those conditions must exist. Mm -hmm. That it's not can be used against you, which figure out how we do that, because reverse engineering is, is a byproduct of any of these things. The second thing, if that cyber tool is used against you, that basically you're impervious to it. You, you have no vulnerabilities that exist that can be exploited by this cyber tool. And the third thing, if indeed that condition exists, that the vulnerabilities have no consequence to you. And no matter what nation you're from, all of us have significant vulnerabilities that would affect our way of life, our economy, our national security, public safety, all those things exist. So the concept of creating the next generation of cyber weapons is something we really, really need to think about. The second piece of this concept is the discipline that goes into it. Uh, you know, there's some rigor that goes into some of the things that take place in, in military operations, and some countries are good at it. But when it's like, well, they've got one, I want one too, and they build it, what controls do you have over it? What ability do you have to control a person who may be part of a, a military structure now that five years from now is a security researcher somewhere, and they can take that same training expertise and use it in a very negative way? So these are things that we really have to think about, and I wish I had some solutions, but I do not. But we really have to consider that in our international discussions moving forward. 
So then the, uh, the, the last thing I want to touch on is, is the provisions of the international strategy. For, for those that may not be familiar with the way things work in the White House and the government, we have a, a fairly protracted process by which somebody comes up with an idea that needs the President's attention, such as an international strategy like this. You bring all the departments and agencies, their perspectives, their expertise, which are tremendously valuable because it would be tremendously short-sighted of us to say, we're going to talk to this one agency who has specific expertise and ignore everyone else. So after a very painful and long discussion on how to do this, you effectively work on this, send it out, people comment on it, they strike this, they argue about this, you have more meetings, and that's the bureaucracy in its best. But you ultimately come out with a document that really represents more than anything a consensus of what's going on. And as I mentioned the, this morning, when the international strategy was released, it was not a strategy about security. It was about cyber peace, interoperability, freedom of expression, freedom indeed recognizing some of the current UN treaties that exist, freedom of uh, uh, the, the human rights doctrine, uh, the, he's about uh, use of force, uh, armed conflict, all these things which many of the experts have said, we think they can be applied in cyberspace like anything else. So, but it was not designed to say, here's what we're imposing upon the world, but this is an invitation. And, and, and for those of you that have not seen it, and, and I would extol you to take the moment and look at it, read it through, through your lens, through your perspective, and see how does this really make the world a better place? Cyberspace has given us greatest capa the greatest capabilities that I can ever, you know, looking back historically. But where will we be 10 years from now, five years from now, when we see that great empire that we built crumbling under its own bureaucracy, under its own weight, its inability to self-govern itself? And in closing, uh, I think one of the things that, that I think more than anything else is it's just fundamentally flawed for us to wait for governments to agree on things. As Dr. Curry knows firsthand, as, as all many of you in this room knows, there is no easy path. Mm -hmm. So there's been much discussion about a treaty, mm -hmm. and I don't think anyone's ever said we will never need a treaty, mm -hmm. but how do we get from here to where we need to be mm -hmm. in a matter that's really gonna, gonna be timely? Mm -hmm. We have to work at internet speed, not government speed. <laughs> we need to make sure that we're looking for solutions now that can be applied later on to a treaty. And there's all kinds of valid arguments. A quick example on the, on the nuclear uh, proliferation treaty where we have agreements that you can go in and you come to my nuclear weapon storage, which whatever it may be, and say, okay, you have 27, you're only supposed to have 25 to get rid of them. Valid argument is how do you do that in cyberspace? We can all sign a treaty, but all take somebody with a laptop or in some cases a smartphone in the back room and can really launch some really desperate things. We've seen with the DDoS attacks and everything else. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of issues that go into a treaty, not uh, taking into account things that Scott brought up about the, even the dispute between cybersecurity and information security. Mm -hmm. And by the way, for the record, we as security professionals had dibs on information security. We <laughs> called it that first. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it, many of our certifications are about information security, but notwithstanding that, but that's a clear example of how governments argue and debate this thing. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the, the confidence building measures we've looked at, the Russian Federation, this is public, it's on my white, old White House blog from when I was there, is I sat down with the Deputy National Security Advisor from the Russian Federation multiple times trying to develop what are the things that we can do as two nations that consider it to be one of the, I think someone used the term this morning, cyber powers, where we can sit there and say, let's ease the tension a little bit. Mm -hmm. Everything from a hotline like there was during the Cold War yeah. to transferring information from emergency response team. You talk about information sharing, that's a good one. Not caring who it is, but let's just share that information. But just as importantly, make sure our military people are sitting around the table to ease the tension. And I know some in this room were part of that in sharing that information so we're, nothing can be misinterpreted. So that's what the international strategy is about. I, I, I think the work that we need to be doing is we can't wait for governments to agree on things. The little, okay, these are the ones that are green, these are the ones that are yellow, these are the ones that are red. We can't afford to do that. Mm. We have to take the lead as, as, as citizens, as NGOs, as universities, and, and you figure the structure 
that will then increase the pressure on governments to do what's right as opposed to what's doing their best interest. Thank you, Scott. Here, here. No, thank you so much, Howard. There's a lot there that I think we want to build on as well. And of course, I share many of your same uh, thoughts about how much words matter. And uh, interesting as well, how much consensus there is around the cyber peace idea. I'd be curious of what you guys in the audience think about this notion as well and how we might define it. Uh, before we get there, though, I want to welcome uh, Professor Shang, who will be bring, bringing in the comparative perspective a little bit, talking about the private sector experience in China, and also, if you'd care to, um, a little bit about uh, how civil liberties enters the discussion here. Thank you. Um, it's, um, it makes me very humble that to listen to the fellow uh, uh, panelists giving their uh, not only very uh, uh, you know, their, their expertise, their experiences, but uh, I'm, I'm quite inspired by their vision and idea. Um, I'm not really a cybersecurity domain expert. And I came from, well, I, my 10 years in astrophysics didn't really help. But uh, <laughs> uh, I came from uh, human rights, internet freedom, um, and digital activism, kind of a re relating adjacent. adjacent. Uh, uh, and uh, I encountered those issues many times, uh, uh, and particularly my daily observation and following is on China. Um, and uh, uh, observing both the cyber uh, citizen behaviors and the civil society and the state censorship control uh, politics. Uh, so I will probably uh, share a few of those observations with you uh, after the discussion. The, you know, in the last two decades or three decades, what we have witnessing is China's rise economically and technologically as well. They uh, very often, and, and of course then that's the, the sort of power and influence in the international uh, arena. So very often when we talk about negotiating with China, discussing issues with China, dealing with China, um, to understand China and Chinese government, um, uh, there is a very strong, uh, uh, how to say, the, the, the perspective is that uh, Chinese government is not monolithic. Uh, uh, there's different agencies pursuing different interests. It's a fragmented authoritarian regime. Some uh, 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 China scholars put uh, high influential Chinese scholar put that way. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, you can do business in China. You know, there's all kind of things that happens while it is a it is a authoritarian regime and a strong centralized government. Uh, can we apply that political insight and understanding to the cybersecurity issue? Mm -hmm. uh, that will be my first question. Uh, does China have a monolithic coordinated policy towards cybersecurity? Um, my short answer is China does have a coordinated uh, a cyber uh, security policy. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not that fragmented in terms of cybersecurity, in terms of uh, internet control. Uh, it is fragmented in many other ways if you're going to do business in China, set up, set up companies in China, dealing with different businesses, trying to get things done in the different provinces, under different agencies. Uh, there is a variety of sort of gray areas you can operate. But in terms of over cybersecurity, uh, 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 or, well, cybersecurity, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on this concept later. In Chinese concept, in Chinese state concept has a different meaning. Uh, that it's quite a nat nationwide centralized uh, 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 policy. And I will, uh, let's see, uh, I'll, I'll illustrate it this way. The internet came into China in the early 90s. Uh, since 1996, there is a called a National Network of Information Security Coordination Small Group. It's a long name, but it is the highest authority of handling all the pro uh, policy aspect of China's internet uh, 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 affairs. And I'll give you a list of names of this, this group. Li Keqiang, today is Chinese premier. 
Liu Yunshan uh, today is in, also in the seven members standing committee and uh, in charge of propaganda. Zhang Dejiang is head of National Congress today, one of the seven in the standing committee. Remember, there's only seven people governing China in the highest authority. I already mentioned three names in this group. Uh, Lin Jihua is a, he's no more in that group, but he's in charge of a domestic uh, uh, party affairs, so kind of a re human resource person uh, for the party. So he, he replaced by other name, but sim simply he's a, he, he was the uh, uh, head of the off staff office uh, 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 of the uh, Hu Jintao and the Hu Jintao. Now with the new president, the new names put it in. Meng Jianzhu is the Minister of Public Security. And Chen Bingde, finally, is PLA. So these are the num number of the people at the highest level to decide China's cyber policy. Not only the level is high, but also has been very coherent, meaning the, the leading group started in 1996 and reformal, formalized in 2002, and now it's 2013. The continuity of such policy, and even you can tell by, from present notes. Mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, a, a sort of a, a, I was saying China has a very strong nationwide centralized security uh, 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 policy making. And I'll put one more uh, uh, thing forward, which is in you know, different states. Governments, when you negotiate, when you're dealing with each other, everybody say we have a core interest, we negotiate, and what can be mutually benefiting or, or that. And what is China's core interest, uh, giving such high level of importance of cybersecurity? Um, you, you, you read from international press all the time uh, saying, well, what's China's core interest, right? National sovereignty, uh, security, territory integrity, uh, peaceful domestic development, you hear from the Chinese press all the time as well. Those are familiar words. Uh, it pretty much can apply to any country. But if you listen to Chinese leader carefully, that's not exactly they really their priority is. And this already being stated, uh, it's reported on China Geo Times, uh, by State Councilor Dai Bingguo, who is a leading official uh, of uh, foreign affairs, uh, and in his visit to the United States in 2009, he publicly stated to United States, to the state government, what is the core of China's interest, the core interest of Chinese state. He said, uh, to ensure the U.S.-China relationship develop forward a stable, healthy, and long-term way, it is very important to mutually understand, respect, and support the other side and defend our own core interest. And he continues, what's the core interest? He said, number one core interest is to maintain a fundamental system and the security of the state. Number two is a state sovereignty and the territory integrity. And the third is a continual stable development of economy and society. It's not that surprising and shocking, but it's made it very explicit that uh, the political stability of the regime is always comes very first. Economy comes later. Even territory, that's secondary. And uh, so if you look at China's internet development, including security policy making, anything coming to the stability or under that banner uh, political stability, regime stability, and now they call, they're using that conceptualize information security, including the concept of what they call content security. Yeah, it's not just a virus, it's not just malware. Uh, they're talking actually political speeches, yeah. But they include it in that regime and thinking, put a top priority of it. And so from this framework, you can understand the state behavior, yeah, uh, uh, it was very different than, and of course there's no public de debate on none of those. Uh, 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 it's very different than, than the other countries you deal with. 
So on an implementation level, uh, these high concepts actually do reflect uh, reality. Unlike many of Chinese government policies in economics and culture and society, social policies, it states one thing, but once gets get, get the ground, it's implemented very differently. Uh, uh, but on those internet control area, the state policy actually implements quite thoroughly and efficiently, you want to say. Um, and this is something in our work that uh, uh, observes all the time. For example, uh, well, I was going to, uh, to, to, to talk more about Google and the recently uh, Apple is being sort of very uh, uh, prominently attacked in China under the name of they're not doing good enough customer service. Uh, <laughs> Well, you know, you, you, you'll find plenty of the pushback in Chinese internet, you know, citizens' comments that will come on. You know, like, that, that we, we, our, our biggest, largest rivers has ten thousands of the dead pigs flowing that the, the national media, state media is not picking on, not, not, not reporting. And you tell me that Apple doesn't replace the, the back cover of their iPhone uh, as a problem. Um, Chinese people don't really buy that. But why the state picking on uh, Apple, among other reasons, or the, the retaliation of the Huawei, sorry, uh, treatment in the United States, is that um, content, the Apple applications, uh, uh, Apple app stores, has those politically undesirable content the Chinese government wants to censor, but Chinese government doesn't have you know, first-hand way to, to do it, and putting all this pressure on Apple uh, 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 to, for him to for Freud to do uh, self-censorship. So all these factors goes into those uh, multinational uh, business. Uh, but in China, once the politics or political priority overrides, mm -hmm. then the business goes second. Um, and uh, another thing, maybe I'll just share some of the more internal observation to, to, uh, to illustrate what I just said. Uh, we have been noticing uh, the recruitment of hackers and the recruitment of cybersecurity professionals from universities, computer uh, 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 network security departments, graduate students, uh, uh, undergraduate students, um, has been intensified in the past uh, several years uh, with explicitly uh, uh, the, the calling for uh, the cybersecurity uh, of the state agencies. Mm -hmm. Meaning they came here, they talked to the faculty, they talked to the students, and uh, they say, I want you to work for state security projects. And who are those agencies actively recruiting? Number one, state security. That's the uh, sort of China's espionage uh, 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 so, uh, agency. Um, but it's not only to the national level, like one central unit recruiting it. Every provincial level, yeah, sort of individually going to the Chinese universities and recruiting hackers and giving them projects. And they're also very well funded. Secondly, the military. Well, we know the third, fourth department of uh, PLA general staff. Uh, uh, these are intelligence gathering, technologically, intelligence gathering units. Like recently in New York Times, we exposed that uh, Shanghai unit, it belongs to the third uh, department of PLA general staff. And uh, Ministry of Public Security, yes. They also goes in actively to recruiting hackers. And finally, was Industry of Information Technology, Ministry of Inf Information uh, Technology. Um, they all have those, what they call the cybersecurity uh, projects. Uh, in a larger scale, uh, actively recruiting people. Uh, nobody knows, well, uh, it's difficult to trace on what they're actually doing, but here are some differences. Um, talking about displaying control and, and, and unpredictability of those. Um, you can imagine those military units, and, and uh, they, they look like in a centralized place, in a one building, probably multiple people working on the project and uh, probably have some kind of discipline and training behind it, whatever their, their project is. But those state security recruited people very often working on an individual basis. 
and uh, very discreet. Uh, especially, they don't have. Uh, uh, they, they, if 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 the different provincial or different units are sponsoring different uh, projects, it's hard to imagine what kind of control and discipline behind it. You don't even know if they are giving a state espionage target at the same time they are not stealing some credit card or not. Yeah. And how do you control these type of behavior even within China? Uh, that's completely black hole. Yeah. And then, what's the consequences to you know inter security internationally? You know, what exactly those hackers doing, uh, 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 and how, what their responsibility really is? Uh, you can't even tell from the state security uh, uh, policy go, and because that control mechanism itself, if it's go out of con uh, 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 control, could cause unintended consequences even for the Chinese state. Um, so I, I can go you know, on, on, on more details, but let me just s summarize to say, um, well, let's say one more thing. Now China has a new pres president. Would, would you this, this general political framework change? The short answer is no. The new president has been uh, sort of very goes up, uh, appealing to the nationalism and as a motivating force. And, and the promise using the, 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 the rhetoric Chinese dream, national uh, renaissance, uh, 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 as part of a platform, he's trying to put his political agenda forward. In that context, I do not see the China's national cybersecurity uh, uh, and the cyber control policy uh, uh, will, will have any change. So given that, it's rather a, a pessimistic uh, 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 condition, uh, that what kind of international treaty we're, we're looking for. Um, let me just end to say, well, in the, in the reality, these challenges are the real. Uh, but to rise to, to the challenges, we always need ideals and vision. Like one internet is a vision. Just like human rights is a vision, right? China is still an authoritarian regime, but still has to sign on international human rights treaties. And even that's not translating to entire practice and regime uh, uh, foundation, but it does has to admit its legitimacy of the international uh, uh, um, sort of acting code. Um, and in the long run, it influences state behaviors and then changes. Uh, so it is possible to inspire to a vision and moving the state towards uh, that direction. Uh, on the Thank you so much for that, Professor. There's a number of important insights there about Chinese cybersecurity and, in some aspects, the bilateral relationship that's going to shape so much of the 21st century, including in the cybersecurity sphere. Um, I'm cognizant of the time, and I want to allow as many questions as possible from the audience. So because of that, I'm going to limit myself just to, to one, uh, use one privilege and just ask one question of the panel before we throw it open, if that's all right. And that's a pretty basic one, <laughs> basic. Um, there have been many proposals out there of different forms that multilateral treaties could take. Some of you might be familiar with Professor uh, Ona's Hathaway's recent uh, take on this. She said that treaty would need two elements. One, we have to define the armed attack threshold. And two, we need deeper international cooperation for criminal prosecution. Others are far more grandiose. Some like the idea of including cyber espionage in it or even banning all cyber weapons. Um, others focus on more low-hanging fruit, as has been talked about, such as amending or perhaps even negotiating a new cybercrime treaty. Regardless of the form it takes, such a treaty is going to have to contend with the political divides we've been talking about, as well as issues over verification and attribution, among others. So hence kind of our first question, the only one that I'll promise that I'll ask at this point. Uh, can multi multilateral treaties prove useful in securing cyberspace? And if so, what might an ideal treaty look like, perhaps leaving politics to one side? And even if it is feasible, is it also desirable? Is that a direction you think we should take? I welcome any thoughts you might have. Listen, uh, I will take on this, uh, this issue because I've been asked when I first talked about this cyber peace concept, what would you put in there, the treaty? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Say, first I will say we commit ourselves to give access to our citizens. That's the first mm -hmm. article that I will see in there. Second, mm -hmm. we commit ourselves to protect them. Mm -hmm. We don't want every citizen to have to, to be liable of his own or her own, uh, her own security. Mm -hmm. 
governments have some role in it, in it and uh, they have just like out in the, whatever is true uh, offline is true online. Three, I commit myself not as a state, not to attack another country first. The same type of weapon you have when you have a, 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 a nuclear weapon, that weapon is in the hand of every citizen today or every country uh, at, in the cyberspace and therefore we have to commit that. And last but not least, we commit yourself to work in a framework of cooperation mm -hmm. with all the member states mm -hmm. to stop criminal activities. Mm -hmm. Those are the type of things that I will see here. It's general, broad principles mm -hmm. that we'll put in there. Mm -hmm. How you go further in implementing it, that's another issue. Mm -hmm. But those are the type of backbones that I will see mm -hmm. in, in a framework like this. But of course, you can't avoid the fact that everyone wants to have a control. I mean, the, the issues that Mr. Xiao mentioned, the principles that are uh, dear to China are same principles to any other country. I know many demo very democratic countries that, are, that have uh, armies of, uh, of bloggers working for them, unfortunately, which is true, you know? But of course, they will accuse other, other governments. So that, therefore, that, therefore it, the issue will always be there that everyone wants to have a real domination deep inside. But in reality, what they will, they will say is completely different. Yeah, it's interesting. I get that this question a lot, particularly as, as we've looked at both multilateral and bilateral discussions with other nations. And I was sitting here to build a little bit on Nicole's uh, paranoia from that PDF that, that she mentioned this morning, just by virtue of the discussion we're having today, I'm sitting here thinking, boy, is my e email going to be more of a target as well as all this <laughs> just because of our association talking about this? And I think that's one of the things that, that some instrument, and, and once again, I'm not a, a, a legal expert by any stretch of the imagination, and what it would be, norms, the treaties, some agreement. But I think all this should be free from the fact that we're going to be targeted of other governments because of what we believe in, what we say, where we go. I mean, there was a recent uh, document put out on telling CEOs what to do to protect themselves when they go to some uh, uh, to visit another country. And it didn't focus only on China, but it was a lot of countries because of the expectation is the minute you log into somebody's network, whether it's your hotel, uh, at a uh, hotspot, that the government's going to be sucking down everything you're doing. And in some cases, that's probably not untrue. So that's one of the things, if, we, if this was ever to be effective, where we'd need to, uh, uh, to take into account. Dr. Torre had mentioned the issue about how do you really implement it. Uh, that continues to be one of the big debates we see over and over again. Mm -hmm. so, there's the perspective that some nations will sign it just to give themselves a little breathing room from what they consider to be advancements that other nations have made that they're far and behind, so give them a chance to catch up so they can be mm -hmm. bad actors as well. Others say, well, yeah, they may do it, but they have a history of, of signing a treaty but not really abiding to it and looking for every loophole that's in there. And they're all valid. That doesn't mean we should sit back and just wait for nothing to happen. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The last thing uh, uh, is the whole issue when we start looking at interpretations and, and, and we talk about in, in, Inter interpretation of stability specifically. I don't know how many times I've, I've sat in meetings both domestically and internationally where people want to give their perspective on what stability is, mm. uh, which is understandable, uh, but it has to take into account, and I think, once again, Norbert's comment this morning about cultures. We have developed cultural norms in this area. So let's take those and let's look at 80% of the things that we agree on we don't have to agree 100% on these things to really make progress. We can put the other things off for those long-term you know, debates that we have as nations that, that really don't affect us on a day-to-day -day basis. That can take place. So in order to make it work, uh, it, it has to be done in that context. Mm -hmm. And sort of the, uh, uh, the last thing we get into is, is acting as an agent of the government it goes to the recruitment of students. Uh, there's not a place that I visit that doesn't have some sort of program to take university students, go out, call them, recruit them to work for defense, intelligence agencies, uh, homeland security agencies in our case, because they're needed because of everything that's going on out there. Mm -hmm. So why the concept itself is not bad, 
the results of that depending upon where you're standing in the room and whether we should or someone should or should not be doing that. Mm -hmm. Because if we disagree that they're using it to steal information from us as individuals to foster a philosophy in a nation that isn't you know, satisfactory for the global community, yeah, that probably was something we wouldn't like to do. Mm -hmm. But recruiting them to help us strengthen our ability, to strengthen our freedom of speech, I think we would all be supportive of that. Mm -hmm. So the role of how you become an agent for the government in, in, in a bigger sense is something that we would need, any, need to take into consideration mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. this was to have any chance of moving forward. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I don't have too much to add. I pretty much uh, uh, um, learning and absorbing and also uh, 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 fails uh, 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 the political response in, in, in terms of uh, the, this, this simple uh, uh, statement, which is, while all these difficulties exist, right, such as uh, what we're talking about, the difficulty, uh, the attribution of cyber attack, but then the, then the difficulty of for uh, any state level to, to admit responsibility, or, you know, giving them you know, always the easy way out in terms of denial. Um, it doesn't should stop the concept of moving uh, 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 the idea of, uh, uh, yeah, having some common understanding uh, ground between the states uh, uh, and have civil society and, and pri private corporations uh, be part of, of that, that, that process. Uh, so I believe the, the, the challenge is there. Uh, uh, if we, we, we are encouraging, uh, uh, we see the, the potential damage um, on everyone, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and and uh, the uh, eroding of the, the internet is a, uh, a common uh, good. Mm -hmm. Then uh, uh, to stay on that agreement, mm -hmm. despite all the state's self agenda and interests, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to moving uh, uh, the international process forward. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Thank, so thank I, if please. I can, please, please one yeah. quick thing, and I apologize, I should have said this before. Mm -hmm. One of the things to your point that's really important is we can't tie the internet security and the well-being of the internet to other issues. Mm. You know, great, mm -hmm. reevaluation of a currency is really important, but I think this is more important than any of the other things that we say, well, we're not going to discuss internet security with you because we don't like what you're doing over here. This has to stand alone on its own in order to, to work. Sorry, mm -hmm. Scott. No, no, that's I perfect. No, thank that. you so much for that. Please, so in the time we have left, we're supposed to break right around 320, 325. I'd love to have as many questions as we can get in, in that period. So if we could start passing the mic around, if anybody has any. If not, I'm happy to ask other ones, but I imagine there's perhaps some out there. Yes, please, Paul. Mm. Actually, this is for Howard, because this is, this is in response to what you just said about internet um, cybersecurity needing to be broken off from all, from other pieces in order to succeed. Um, it strikes me that that's the exact opposite of, of at least where many people are going, which is to see yep. cybersecurity, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that uh, an American response to Chinese cybersecurity breaches might be diplomatic in nature or economic in nature. Congress just passed a, a bill to prohibit the purchase of Chinese IT unless the government can certify that it's free of, of defects, which no government's going to be able to do. So um, does that make you think that that type of uh, merging of uh, or cross-government sort of response is fundamentally flawed and we should affirmatively break this out? And if your answer to that is yes, and since you're nodding, I'm going to guess it is, the question <laughs> is um, why, because that would say that cyber is different than almost every other endeavor where if we have a, a law enforcement problem with China, we sometimes respond with financial or diplomatic. I mean, we, we use the whole of government response me mechanisms. So what makes cyber, in your judgment, different? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, that we, we don't have a history on this. I mean, just bear in mind that the commercial interest in the Internet, as, as my friend Tom Ridge says all the time, has been around for about 20 years now. So it's not as if there's this long-standing privateer, law of the sea, all these other things have existed. This is new enough mm -hmm. and meaningful enough and important enough, we can't somehow take bits and pieces of other things and say, well, we're not going to get better internet security, we're not going to get better norms in cyberspace unless you move your ship 25 miles from where it's currently parked because we don't like it. That may be a very, very valid threat that we have concerns about, but don't tie them together. 
And so, and by the way, uh, Paul, I was shaking my head yes because I was acknowledging the, the wisdom that you were saying in the question, uh, not necessarily agreeing or disagreeing, but the bottom line is yes, we, we, we have to recognize this indeed is different in many ways that it should stand alone on its own to move it at an accelerated place, and I use the term all the time, move at internet speed, not government speed. That's the way we can detach some of these things that are really holding us back in these areas. Any other? Uh, yes. Mike, can you take the mic. I'm happy to repeat that as well. Yeah. So the question was the more of the bottom-up approach that I think Irv referred to in the last panel. Should we go the direction of these small, like-minded clubs? Start bilaterally. Maybe start with small groupings to build consensus that could then be broadened out, whether in a series of norms or common codes or as a stepping stone. So. I fully agree with you. We, we have to start this thing in smaller groups, and that's why even on the themes, we have to go to, on, as I said, on the low-hanging fruits, mm -hmm. issues that we have in common. You know, and That's why when I put the, the, the COP initiative, the Child Online Protection Initiative, on the table, mm -hmm. I, I had many attentive ears because uh, it's an issue that is common to everyone. Child, children are, are an emergency. They are the most vulnerable. They are the biggest users of, of the net. It's our future. And, uh, you know, we all agree on the type of crimes around them. Uh, so we, 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 we are able to find some ways to, to do something concrete as we are talking. Uh, awareness building is key to all of these things. And this is why uh, if, even if we achieve nothing at, at the international level in terms of uh, uh, coming with the treaty, to me, the biggest, my, my best goal is to just raise awareness on the issue so that people talk about it and talk about it frankly mm -hmm. and see genuinely what are the areas where they can have find solutions. And again, uh, if you find those little circles uh, without excluding anybody, and that's why I think the multi-stakeholder model of internet is very important, and, but that means not to exclude anybody. Everybody is a stakeholder. Therefore, uh, we need to make sure that the issue is debated on, in all circles, and then it will somehow be channeled. And uh, as we continue to harvest the low-hanging fruits, I mean, I mean some, somewhere we're going to be there. But again, there is a, uh, this issue of uh, trying to, to control. Every nation, in fact, deep inside, wants to be the one controlling the internet, mm -hmm. whether they say it or not, whether they are democratic or not, they want to control it. In fact, uh, to be frank, I have not seen a hacker being jailed anywhere. If a small hack, a smart hacker, they don't jail him; they hire him. Unfortunately, that, that, which is unfortunate, but uh, it's, it's the case uh, because of uh, states' desire to have the best to control. Now, those interests may not necessarily be contradictory. We at ITU believe in that because we have that uh, being the oldest organization of the UN and it's a very good framework of cooperation between private sector and public sector, we also have been working in an environment which was not politicized. Uh, I've really been confronting political issues only lately. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in December during the WCIT conference, that's the only time I really see so some real uh, very tense uh, political oppositions. I mean, just in January last year, during the World Radio Conference, I was able to broker a deal between Israel and Palestine, a common resolution without having to go through a vote. And those things happen in a regular basis at ITU. And therefore, I'm saying we have a platform to try and get people to talk to each other. We, I'm not saying that we should be centralizing all of these things or the one being brokering this but we do have some contribution, like any other, other, other circle. And therefore, if we combine our efforts together, we'll be able to achieve something. Mm -hmm. So, Jeff, there's three quick comments I want to make on that. One, the whole concept of boiling the ocean is just, you know, the first thing that comes to mind when you hear something that, how should we do that? You're never going to boil the ocean. Secondly, since we like to always use examples, look at the building of the Internet. Uh, Vin and, and Bob Metcalf and, and Tim Berners-Lee, they weren't sitting back here years ago and say, this is what the internet's gonna look like in 2013. And we build a piece, we build a piece, add it, change things. And I think that's the same thing that applies here. There's gotta be those 
in some cases, bilateral, small multilateral issues. The third thing, the example, the, the, the example I like to use is the evolution of money laundering laws, and I think there's some, some good comparisons to that. I remember back in the early days of my law enforcement career, money laundering was sort of the scourge of the world. I mean, there were some nations that participate because they were just fundamentally corrupt. Mm -hmm. Their leadership benefit from it. They, they, they helped foster it because they made money on it. Other nations sort of took a blind eye to it. They said, listen, yeah, it helps our, you know, that we're making more cars, so we're selling them because bad people are doing bad things with the money. And then there were those that said, under the rule of law, we, money laundering is fundamentally bad, created international laws, because by the way, there weren't laws at the time. And then so now you're sort of like a pariah if you're not in part of that club. And I think that's the same way we need to build this, where if you're not going to be part of the internet community to be security and privacy protection, all those other things, you're going to be ostracized by the rest of us. And no nation really wants to be there. And how you get there is you take a, a, a bite it at a time and say, let's fix this, let's go with them. The, I mentioned earlier the green, green, yellow, red, didn't really explain that. So there's some of us that are already like-minded. And then there's others, those in that group that are green, that have relationship with some of those in sort of the yellow category. They're not quite sure what to do. And they have relationships with the ones in the red category that just think this, you know, we want total government control. That's the way you influence this, that's the way you build it, and that's the way you get this thing moving a lot quicker. Uh, I would also pick up again on your question about whether multilateral uh, mechanism will work or bilateral. We know for sure that bilaterals will take, if I have to do a little bit of calculus here, 193 member states of ITU multiplied by 192, it comes to 37,056 bilateral agreements to be made if countries have to do those bilateral agreements. That's why you try to create a regional framework or an international framework where people will adhere into, but you do that in terms of principles so that it won't be too cumbersome. Uh, and that's, for sure we know that the bilateral won't work or it will take, uh, uh, you know, centuries to be, to be agreed upon. And it will find itself with uh, uh, different holes in the bucket because they may not be compatible with one another. And therefore, you always wish to have something uh, on, on a multilateral uh, level. Mm. Now, can you do that at the regional level to start with, like the Council of Europe, the, with the Budapest Convention, and move on into different regions? Or you do it on a global scale, but one has to talk about it, one has to start something. Some tell me, oh, it's gonna take 10 years to, uh, to work on an agreement. Oh, 10 years is nothing in the, in the, in the lifetime. And uh, if it takes 10 years, let's start now. Someone someday will sign something that will have a positive contribution to the world. Thank you so much. Any other questions for our panelists? We have time probably for one, one, maybe two more. I thought we really wore them down. Yeah, <laughs> that's the end of a marathon here. If I thought about what I learned here today, um, one point is um, the user is not really the problem. Government are bad <laughs> and not fast enough. And if I see my experience as a co computer scientist, we have already uh, invented more secure, more trustworthy, more robust systems, but the, uh, the companies are not willing to, to use it because it don't fit in their business models. And my question is, who have to take the responsibility to bring the process forward? So we discuss a lot of ideas, but I don't see an organization or whatever who take responsibility for the process. I'm sure it will take 10, 20 years, but we have to start. And I have no idea who could be responsible for the process. You know, my answer is you're right. Uh, we, we don't have anyone, and I don't know that the, the, distribute, the very distributed nature of the Internet mm -hmm. keeps us from having a central body in charge of it that, that basically would take the lead in making these things happen. Uh, Dr. Wright mentioned about the speed. Uh, was it the GG, the Group of Government Experts, mm -hmm. uh, which I would argue the expertise, but that's a side discussion. But they meet every two years. 
Can you imagine if I was getting ready to roll out a product as a computer scientist for me to have a meeting once every two years to build the next great app? It would never happen. Mm -hmm. And so those are the things when we start looking at the very distributed nature of the internet, I think the solution and the responsibility is shared. We have the private industry, we have the academia, we have all these people that continue to push this forward as, as we're doing here today by saying we can't wait for any one group to take control because it will never happen. And if it does, it'll probably be the wrong one anyway. Mm -hmm. I fully mm -hmm. agree with that before, and, and this is uh, something that is uh, really distributed, and uh, but everyone has a role to play in it. Mm -hmm. Now, people should not be afraid of playing their role for fear of uh, of uh, being criticized for taking control. That's what happens whenever we at the IQ level play our role, little role. People say, "Oh, they want to take over the, con the, the control." It's not the case, but we, that's not going to deter us from doing that playing that role, and I think that's the way everyone should be, behave because uh, the issue we are d dealing with is a, a very high stake. Mm -hmm. It is very important for the future of uh, the future generations. Mm -hmm. We need to do something about it. It's a serious problem. Mm -hmm. Now, some people will, will tell, you, tell you, no, if it broke, don't fix it. Mm -hmm. uh, or don't talk about the war. There will no, be no cyber war. We want to avoid it. Well, I wish every day, the best way to win a war is to avoid it in the first place. And I wish every day we're saying we won a war by avoiding it. And, and, and especially in this type of environment where a single brain can, can take on the whole world. You know, this is not an area where there is a superpower. Nobody should fool himself or herself that his country is a superpower in this. Every single, it's a brain power that makes a difference, and you can have a genius anywhere. anywhere. Look at the, the worst little viruses ever made. You know, I'll give an example of the, uh, the I, love, I Love You bug, which has the widest spread in the world back in 2002. It was built by someone in the Philippines from a, a, a wooden house with a laptop less than $1,000. That's the power of this thing. So, Individuals can be anywhere, so and, and therefore we we, uh, we we should not underestimate anyone. So how do we work together to make it happen? That's for me. That's a question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, building off of that idea of a networked distributed approach to a networked distributed problem, I thought I would just ask kind of one final question here, and that's around the topic we've been dancing about a little bit, and that's the end game. What are what's the goal? Uh, what is the best we can hope for in terms of peace on the internet? Is cyber peace possible? And do you have a vision for what that peace might look like? I put that question to a few folks I was interviewing for the book, and I got some great responses. One former government, government official said, cyber peace would be an entire weekend without my BlackBerry going off. And I like that. I like that. Um, but perhaps I thought maybe you could uh, share your own insights into where we're headed in an idealized world, and maybe, maybe a little more how, how we can get there. Whoever would like to take an idea there. Yes, I, I guess I don't think any of us would be sitting here if we didn't believe that it's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I, the, the end game would be, and I think we try to articulate in our international strategy, mm -hmm. the world we envision where citizens are free from cybercrime, that governments are interoperable, we have the economic benefit of it, and, and you know it's, it's very clear in there. So yes, I believe it's possible, and I believe that, that constantly talking about this and constantly making changes in the way we view the world from a cyberspace perspective will get us there. Mm -hmm. I just yeah. hope I live long enough to see it. <laughs> I believe that uh, the leaders of our countries and uh, the, the leaders of the industry and academia have the obligation to dream and dream big mm -hmm. for the people mm -hmm. and so that our industry be one, the one that is uh, the most peaceful one. And uh, th 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 we, once uh, we share that dream, it becomes a vision. And I think everything starts from there. A peace will come from a vision. If we don't believe in it, it will never happen. And I strongly believe in it. That's why I've been advocating this uh, from uh, the day I took office. And I will continue to do so even after uh, I finish this office because I believe that the future generations uh, that are very uh, much rely on, on the cyberspace uh, need to continue to evolve in this area. Let's make, there's nothing wrong in us calling for making this one space where there was no war, 
to be a peaceful one, to continue to be so, a place where citizens of all the, all the planet can really work together in a peaceful manner. Well, I don't think we're going to find a more optimistic note to end on than that. So please join me in thanking again the distinguished panel for all their thoughts. <laughs>